Welcome back folks to part two of our looking at this uh, Zwi DSO 3D12 instrument. I'll call it an instrument because it's an oscilloscope and it's supposed to be a DMM and it's supposed to have a function generator built into it. So it's, it's more than just a, an oscilloscope. It's, it's a multifunctional instrument. So today we're going to, you know, go through a little uh, more detail on the oscilloscope itself. I want to, I want to check out most of these um, specifications here. And some of them, some of them, we could just give it right off the bat. Like I, I'll mark that good. I'll mark that good. Let's see about the screen here. Is it 3.2 inches? Yeah, I'll mark that off. 250 milli sam million samples per second. We can check that when we're doing the bandwidth here. If we go beyond half that frequency, and things should start to fall apart. Uh, that would verify if we indeed have 250 million samples per second this this equivalent sampling rise time three nanoseconds the resolution on the cursors isn't good enough to measure this but if we're getting it up to 120 megahertz on the bandwidth yeah then it's the rise time will be better than three nanoseconds storage depth i'm not going to check this i'll just look at some i'll do some zooms on it we'll see if we can you know zoom in sufficiently let's check the impedance right now as a matter of fact one meg ohm. So, okay, we'll give it that. Sensitivity, we'll go through that. Maximum voltage, I'm not gonna try and blow it up, so I'll believe them on that. But most times you're gonna be using a Pro 110, and uh, 400 volts is pretty good. Trigger mode, auto normal single. We went through the menu on that the last time. Trigger type, rise and fall, yeah, we saw that. Display mode, time long Y axis and row mode. Persistence none, one second and infinity. We had a look at that in the last video. Coupling AC and DC for sure, it has that. Auto, yeah, we tried that out last time. We'll, we'll be trying it out several times during this session as well. 14 measurement types, yeah, we went through those the last time. DC offset, I don't know if I'm going to bother to test this or not. I don't know if it's that important for a, for a beginner scope. XY mode, I might have a look at that, we'll see. Um, screenshot support, it, 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 it has it, but it's, it's rather limited in that you can't get the screenshots off it. It'll take a screenshot and allow you to store several of them that you can recall later to have a look at. Technically it has that, but it's not ideal. Single trigger support, yep, we'll have a look at that. FFT, we'll have a look at that. Now I did want to show you a couple of things I didn't show you the last time. So let me show you them now. So if you want to get into the DMM menu, you just press the select button and it takes you into the digital multimeter menu. And you've got all the different measurement types that you can go through. And each one of those is auto ranging. But another thing I wanted to show you as well is if you do a quick press on the power button, this home menu comes up and you can go to oscilloscope, DMM, generator and view, which will just bring you to whatever it is you have on display and then personalized setup. Because if we go in here, you can see that it has a personalization menu. So you can you can choose what kind of graticule you have, whether it's dot, line, or none. You can choose the grid brightness, color of the, the different uh, channel. Channel 1 is always yellow, but you can choose, choose channel 2 as being green, pink, or blue color. I'm going to go with the pink because that's the way it came. You can change the default window for the digital multimeter is small window or full screen. I would go with the small one because you can use the multimeter while you're using the scope and it's handy not to have it wipe out everything you're looking at on the scope. And if you want to invert the display or not. So yeah, let's, let's have a look at that. So if we get in here and then some people might like that. It's reminiscent of the old Tektronix monochrome and their first color scopes, but I don't particularly like it. And that's it. But let me show you one other thing that's not documented. So what it is, you go into menu mode, uh, come down here to uh, display menu, and then you hit it again. Then you have uh, the ability to turn on and off a frequency counter or a, a event counter. So if we go here, we turn on the counter, we can see up in the, the top right hand corner here, uh, like a lot of oscilloscopes, you'll get a, a frequency counter. Yeah, I'm going to leave that on for now, just to see how well it works. And uh, we'll continue on. So let me put this aside for a second. So the first thing we want to do is, is uh, let's test the bandwidth on it. Okay, so here we have it set up. We're going to use this little tiny SA as our frequency source. And let me get the signal, 
600 megahertz scope up here and uh, we'll compare it to this. Uh, if we look at this here, we have uh, 80 megahertz going into it, but we can see the frequency here is coming up at 36. So this frequency meter that they've added in uh, in this latest firmware update has got some bugs. So I'm going to just get rid of that. Okay, and we'll go by this one down here. So it's uh, saying 80 megahertz. It's bouncing around just a little bit, but it seems to be accurate enough. The signal is saying we've got 79.9999999, so 80 megahertz. So they, they agree. Um, this is giving us a peak to peak voltage of 50, about 53 millivolts. The signal is saying it's 43, so it's a little bit optimistic here. So let's take it down to, let's say, 10 megahertz. And, uh, and we'll see around about uh, 46 millivolts which is a better agreement with what we're seeing on the segment, which is about 49 millivolts. So what I suspect they're going to be doing here, in order to get the 120 megahertz bandwidth on it, they're actually going to enhance the gain at the higher frequencies. So we might even see it go up. Then we should be seeing a range of between about uh, 34.6 to 69.3 uh, millivolts on here. And we're, we're within that right now. So let's, uh, let's bring it back up and we'll start our run. Let's start at, at 90 megahertz and run it up then 10 megahertz at a time. Okay, so we're at 57 here, which we're still within the 3 dB. You can see the signal's gone down to about 41. Let's now go up to 100. 65, we're still within the, the 3 dB. Let's go up to 110. 67, 66. Let's go up to 120 here. Now we've uh, we've blown over here at 85. So they've really kind of pushed the the upper end to get their their claimed frequency response. So this there's, there's here's something odd. So on the 10 millivolt scale, it's reading 80 around 85 millivolts. Now if we go to the next level on here, so which is 20 millivolts per division. Uh, it drops down completely, so there, there's something a little bit odd going on here. We're reading a frequency of 120, so that's fine. And that's basically what we're reading on the signal as well. But let, let me back this off here, back down to 80 megahertz. And I see it, it doesn't pop up. And if I go up to here again, right, we're, we're getting it different. We shouldn't be, the peak to peak voltage should not be changing as I change ranges here. This is a far better agreement with the signal. I don't know what's happening here. Let's go back down to one megahertz and see if there's that that, that different exists difference exists there as well. Okay, for a 56, 57 millivolts, and what do we got here? 56, 57, so it's 55.6 millivolts. So a down at lower frequency doesn't do it, so it's a very frequency dependent thing. Let's uh, let's bring it up to 10 megahertz. Let's see, try, try and find out where this sort of thing happens. So we're at 45, 46. So it's still, it's, it's fairly consistent here. Let's bring it up to 60 megahertz. I think I average around about 47 there, measuring around about 45. So it's around about here, around about the 50, 60 megahertz region where there's a little bit of discrepancy in the attenuator. So the frequency response of the attenuator is not consistent across all the different levels. Let's see if we go the other way one more time. Okay, so that seems to be more consistent with this. And then we're getting a little extra amplification up here, but it really begins to show. So if we go up here to 120 again, yeah, these two are consistent with each other. We're getting 40, 49, 55, and then we go to here, we're up to 80. It seems to work at 120 megahertz, but it is going to exaggerate the, the reading you're getting in. If you're reading in the 20 millivolts per division, this is looking not too bad. It's within the 3 dB range. If we go up to here, it blows it out. That's a little bit odd. Okay, let's see if we can go beyond it. Just gonna test for this. We are actually getting 250 milli samples per second. It seems like we're getting at least 240. You can see here's a little bouncing around uh, of the, the waveform, and that means we're getting pretty close to that Nyquist point. So Nyquist point would be at 125. So let's put it there and see what we get. 
Yeah, it's fallen flat on its face. 120 is a, is a hard limit on this. And uh, I don't know if it's my particular attenuator, but uh, going to this scale here kind of blows out your readings a little bit up in these higher frequencies. All these ranges seem to come up around about 60. This range drops it down to around about 50. And then this range here, you're up to 85. It should, it should read the same on every one. Okay, that's a, that's a little bit of a negative, but it does work up to 120 megahertz, as they say, and it does seem that indeed it does have 250 mega samples per second. So uh, we do have to remember in all of this that we're, we are looking at an oscilloscope that costs around about 80 bucks US. Let me enable the second channel here, see what we get. Right now what happens is you're, you're splitting up that sampling probably at 125 mega samples per second and you're dividing up the ADC between the two different channels so you can't use this at 120 megahertz with two channels going. So we should be able to see it fine at 60 megahertz so, so let's bring it down there and see if that comes back into reality. So we're measuring the 60 megahertz and our voltage is in very good agreement with the siglent. We're good with that. Let's let's bring it up to 70. See how it does at 70. I will imagine it'll it'll be it will fail. It's showing the waveform, although not at the right frequency. Um, it is actually showing it at a slightly lower one, and it's measuring it at that slightly lower frequency. So yeah, it's with two channels on, it's a hard stop at 60 megahertz. So we'll bring it down to 50. That's better. So we're seeing a nice 50. We're seeing a better display. Again, we're we're running up near the micro points we're getting a little bit of aliasing they don't control that very well so let's take channel 2 off again and let's do a single shot trigger on this let's uh, I want to bring it in a little bit tighter though I'll do a single shot on it zoom out and can we move through the waveform yeah so the zoom zoom works I don't know if we're getting 128 kilo points but it, it certainly looks like we're getting a, a nice lot of them um, trigger mode auto normal single so we, we just saw the single we're in auto so let's put it on normal which should look basically the same as long as you got something to trigger on and uh, let's let's shift the trigger up and what should happen if we go past the triggerable point it shouldn't show anything on it should show no trace at all so yeah so the normal works as expected Trigger type rise and fall. So right now we're, we're triggering on the rising edge. The way to change it, hit shift and then hit that. So that'll change it to falling edge, hit shift and rising edge. So that's working. And what were we gonna check? We're gonna check uh, for roll mode. But do we have the roll mode set on here? Let me have a look. Roll is set on. So once we get down to a certain level, it should automatically go into roll mode. Okay, so we've got one hertz coming through. It's able to measure the frequency. All right, roll mode's working as expected. Persistence, and that's what uh, no persistence looks like. The trace is refreshed every update. If you put persistence on, so if you set it to one second, every trace lasts a second on the screen. So you'll get multiple updates, and it looks like this. Let's put it on infinite persistence. And basically any deviations will remain on the screen. So here's something else I wanna show you. Let's turn this off. Let's go back to zero persistence. And I wanna show you, so look at this here. Let's do a single to capture. You see these little bumps on the waveform? You don't see those over on the siglent. These little things, these little variations here shouldn't really be there because they're not there in the signal. But we're getting them because a lack of control of the aliasing. But if you want to spend 80 bucks and you want to get the DMM and a function generator, then this is what you're going to get. Okay, so let's, we've done that. We've done the, we've shown the auto. We've shown the different measurements in the last video. FFT, let's put it on log and select that. Exit the menu. Now there's something they don't really tell you here about the FFT, at least I couldn't find it in here. The only way I could get it to work is to have the time base set at 100 nanoseconds or less. So now you do have a cursor here you can move along so you can see that. Now our fundamental here, 10 megahertz. Then we have a harmonic at 30 megahertz. And a harmonic at 50. 
so on. So it, it works, but there's no measurements. So I can't tell how many dB down that is. I'd only be randomly guessing. Let's see, move this out of the way. You get a display here, but the frequency measurements are not correct. So it's saying five megahertz, which is not correct. So you, you really need this uh, at 100 nanoseconds or beyond. So you can only look at a few of the harmonics going up here. It's a pity, I think that's a bug. I think uh, they need to be made aware of that. I'll try to let them know about some of the stuff that I found here, but it would be useful if it, it read the right frequencies in this mode, because I can see more of the harmonics. Although again, I can't measure them, so I don't know what the relationship is. Now let's try it in uh, in linear mode here. I'm gonna have to move the trace up this way to see things. Okay, um, frequencies are right again. It gives you some idea, I guess, of the harmonics that are there. Uh, I don't know how truly useful it is since you don't get any measurements, so except for frequency. I want to show you the cursors. So if we try to measure like uh, the rise time here, so if I say that's uh, that's a ten percent there, and then we bring this one in here. We're around about five nanoseconds rise time here. Actually, that signal function generator is, is around about four nanoseconds. So, but I can't uh, I can't get this precisely um, because it, it, you can only change it one nanosecond at a time in each direction. So, let's see if we can have a look at the the peak to peak voltage. So we're getting about 950 millivolts here. Let's see if we can uh, do that with the Y cursors. So let's get those up. And uh, let's bring this one down here to approximately here. And then the other one up. So 968 millivolts and the scope itself has got to get around about that as well. So yeah, that's okay. Yeah, so we've already got one nanosecond here and, and, and at this particular vertical scale, we've got about 16 millivolts on the Y cursors. All right, so I've got uh, one kilohertz sine wave going into channel one and uh, 999 hertz sine wave going into channel two, and we're getting what we should get there. Let's, uh, let's adjust frequencies a little bit here. Two kilohertz going into channel one, three kilohertz. XY mode seems to work. Oh yeah, let's do a let's do a screenshot here. Let's have a look at that, and uh, let's just save a picture of that. Save done. Let's have a look at it now. So if we go to Shift View, we see here that we have one screen saved here. Press this button here. If we want to delete it, we would press this button here, and it's deleted. But that's that's all the image you can do. We can't save those and put them onto a different device. So that's that's a little bit of a drawback. And I did not measure the charge current. Let me see, is there a convenient way I can actually do that? It's measuring about one amp going into it. So that little specification is a little bit off. I don't know if that's good or bad. I guess that's up uh, to each one of us to decide. I don't mind it taking an amp to charge. Okay, taking all that into account, I'd say this this thing so far is good value. You know, it's not perfect. You can't expect a eighty dollars scope to be perfect. It uh, it does a lot. It offers a lot, and it's fairly easy to use. Also, I would point out that the uh, the battery lasts a good long time. I mean, I did have it on charge before I started using it today, but you can see that it, you know the the the, the battery symbol there is full. So we've been at this now about 45 minutes to an hour and it's not even moved off the, the end yet. So it's got a really good long battery life. It's got a good range. It's yeah, and it meets its specifications. A few little rough edges on it, but uh, other than that, it's, it's pretty good. So, okay, I think that's it for this uh, episode. I think we've done everything we can with the scope right now. If I've left anything out, please put it down in the comments. And then when we come back for part three, I'll try and cover it. We'll see you back then where we're going to look at the DMM and a brief look at the function generator. Thanks very much for coming out and bye bye now.